Okay, so if everyone is ready to go, we can go ahead and get started. Um, for anyone uh, who hasn't been on before, welcome to the Sustainability and Energy Expo. Uh, my name is Vijay. I'm one of the events directors for UMAN Energy Club. Uh, we're co-hosting the event with the Institute on the Environment. And I'm really excited to join you all with our awesome panel for the day. We have four panelists today who bring all sorts of perspectives from different components of sustainability as a practice throughout several industries. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to start uh, by introducing Dr. Shanda DeMorest. She is a member engagement manager with Practice Green Health, an affiliate faculty member at the University of Minnesota School of Nursing, and a practicing cardiovascular nurse at Abbott Northwestern Hospital. She's an active member of the Minnesota-based Health Professionals for a Healthy Climate, as well as the lead of the Nurses Climate Challenge, which is a national campaign to educate 50,000 health professionals about the health impacts of climate change by 2022. And she has also published works on environmental sustainability in healthcare and the health impacts of climate change in local, state, and national journals. Uh, so thank you for joining us, Dr. Morris, if you'd like to speak a little bit more about your work. Thank you so much for the invitation to be on the panel today, Vijay, and for the full um, energy club at the University of Minnesota. And nothing else to add. I'm just looking forward to the conversation. Wonderful. Okay, uh, next next up we have uh, Ms. Joanna Esther Schneider, who is a product development engineer with 3M's Commercial Solutions Division. Um, she also was formerly the technical sustainability representative with 3M's Infection Prevention Division. With undergraduate and graduate degrees in material science and engineering, she has worked to launch the first bio-based surgical drape, commissioning life, life cycle assessments, and has served on the chair of several industry organization committees. In addition, she has led the publication of several documents on the sustainable design of medical devices. In addition to her accomplishments in industry, which has allowed a deep understanding of complex environmental challenges, she also serves as a board member of Sustainable Stillwater Minnesota, where she continues to work on developing a sustainable future in the local community. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, I'll just also um, let the the bio you have speak for itself and we'll get on to the discussion. Sure. So, thank you. Okay. Awesome. Next up, we have Ms. J. Drake Hamilton, who is the Science Policy Director for Fresh Energy. An expert in climate and energy policy at the state and national levels, her responsibilities include scientific analysis and policy development of clean energy solutions to global warming that will maximize economic opportunities. Jay represents fresh energy at international climate summits and showcases Minnesota's nation and showcased Minnesota's nation leading deep, deep climate carbon reductions to global audiences. Hamilton serves on the advisory board of the Irving Institute for Energy and Society at Dartmouth College. She earned undergraduate and graduate degrees in physical geography and from Dartmouth College and the University of Minnesota with an emphasis on climatology and water resources, formerly an assistant professor at the George Washington University. Thank you for joining us, Jay. Thank you, Vijay. I'm so happy to be on this panel. Excited to have you as well. And lastly, we have Mr. Jose Luis Villasenor, who is the environmental justice coordinator at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency and the founder of Tamales y Bicicletas. Um, he works on environmental justice issues within his community of South Minneapolis and works on raising the awareness of, in of the intersectionality of racial, environmental justice, and climate resiliency. He is an educator in radical, critical outdoor pedagogies and a fighter for the decolonization of our bodies, mind, and environment. And his major in ethnic studies looks at the roots of cultural empowerment, especially of indigenous peoples, to influence equitable policy change and development. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Villasenor. Thank you for having me. Um, I have a list of prepared questions. So before we have audience questions coming in, we have three people working behind the scenes, Jessica Jersek, Fatima Tufel, and Peter Levin. Thank you to all of them for working behind the scenes to keep everything going. Uh, but in the meantime, we do have some prepared questions. And so we're just gonna dive right into those. One of the, my, my first question here is, for those of us who are entering sustainability, um, as, as a field now, what, what are the things that you feel are the biggest challenges facing our generation in entering this field? And what are some opportunities where we can take these challenges and turn them into growth? For anyone who'd like to start. I'll go start. 
This is J. Drake Hamilton. I think the biggest challenge is we have to cut emissions across our economy by 45% by 2030 to solve the climate problem, to start solving it. And I want to have people start telling more the good news behind this. That's happened just in the year 2019. So Minnesota's electric power producers cut back on their carbon emissions 14% between 2018 and 2019. Coal went from 38% of our generation in 2018. Last year it was only 32%. Renewable energy accounted for 84% of new generation capacity in Minnesota since 2010. Wind and solar technologies are now the cheapest new electrical generation in Minnesota. Lots of good news. Yeah, no, that's that's fantastic. And definitely something that with the doom and gloom in the news about where things are going, it's definitely refreshing to hear about positive changes that are happening. Um, other thoughts? Yeah, um, I have a comment. Um, so opportunities, I think um, there are so many opportunities because we really do still have a long way to go. Um, I think we're in a really good position where the research is kind of catching up to where we are. So we know what the challenges are, which that is good, and we know what to do. Um, I, I think the biggest challenge for people going into this field is figuring out how you can um, and again, I'm a 3M employee, so I have more of the corporate perspective, um, how, how you can leverage what you want to do um, and make sure that it's meeting your stakeholders' goals also. So, you know, for any for-profit business that's making money, so how can you pitch your solution as a cost savings or a long-term benefit for the company in some way? So I think that's a challenge, but it's also I mean, knowing that you have to communicate with different people for what matters to them, I think it's an opportunity as well. So it's kind of both. Can you repeat the question? I apologize. Sure. Uh, it's, what do you think are the biggest sustainability challenges facing our generation as we enter the field? I'll pitch out some ideas to, the, sure. to that doom and gloom question. Um, <laughs> And again, I, my perspective is healthcare. And I think when people are going into the sustainability industry, it's common that they'll learn a lot about um, basically what that means from their traditional education, right? If you do a degree in sustainability or energy or something in the harder sciences, sustainability and environmentalism is more implicit in that. But when I look at my landscape of healthcare, um, US healthcare uses 10% of greenhouse gas emissions in the United States. And we're the fifth largest emitter as a global industry, um, healthcare is across the planet. But health professionals aren't learning about this. Um, patients don't know what type of footprint they have just by being part of the healthcare industry as you know as a recipient of care and so for the folks who don't come from that scientific educational background there's a huge knowledge gap and not only is that happening with students entering whatever their industry is we have a lot of you know either health professionals or practitioners or just people in you know, basically people living their lives right now, not going through formal education, who don't necessarily know what they can do together to help reduce the problem. They know the problem's there, but what are the steps to take action? Sure. So using education, therefore, as a tool to help inform everyone on ways that they can be, to, to reduce their footprint and sort of be aware of the effect that they're, the impact that they're having. Absolutely. Across all majors. Sure. Um, any thoughts? Go ahead. Yeah, I think, you know, I'm trying to understand this question, to be honest, but I think, you know, one of the challenges that we're facing in particular in working as I work at the Pollution Control Agency is making sure that we are uh, identifying some of the racial barriers and uh, the white term happiness culture that exists within agencies so that we contain uh, the intelligent engineers of color within this industry, and also to support 
uh, students that are in those fields uh, to uh, know that there is uh, mechanisms that are being put in place so that we challenge these environments uh, so that we have more diverse voices uh, that are in the, these fields that are coming from overburdening communities and are, are playing a role in, um, from my perspective, playing a role in, um, you know, having our agency fulfill our mission of protecting the, the, the environment and human health. Sure. Okay, yeah, thank you all for your thoughts on that. Um, it doesn't look like we have any audience questions coming in quite yet. So I'm gonna move on. Uh, what skills or experiences do you find most helpful to you in making changes in your field? So those can be kind of like soft skills or scientific technical skills or any combination of those. What are, what are skills that you draw on that really help you in your work? I, I, would, I would have to say, you know, <clears throat> a lot of the, the skills that, um, that we or I uh, and making sure that our commissioners and senior leadership at our agency be aware of is that soft, so-called soft skills or, uh, are seen as the same intensity and level as an engineer. Um, and the fact that uh, agencies like ours are just tripping over themselves and really having the skills to authentically engage communities uh, that our industries are in and or uh, facilities are located in. And so I, I know that we're working a lot to train our staff uh, to have those skills, but to also make sure that we're connecting uh, and hiring uh, folks that come with these, not I want to call them soft, soft skills, but necessary skills as a regulatory uh, agency that we are. Uh. And I think I would add to that, that what I bring to it, I think, and that we try to, I try to lift up when I speak to students is to make sure that they bring their whole self, uh, their, their community perspective and their voice, because that's also at times what's missing um, in, in, in a data-driven agency is the, the voice and the, the testimonials. Well, I think we need to bring a whole host of skills, but I'm gonna highlight one particular one that was relatively new to me when I started my job back when Fresh Energy had three staff people and now we're at 29 staff. But for the first couple of years, we spent our time, about 40% of our time, building relationships. Because we knew that we would need probably hundreds of people in Minnesota um, collaborating with us on various projects and on our, um, all of our goals. And we needed to build these relationships and really develop trust. And um, I came from academia, and that was a new skill set for me. And I love it now because it, it, it really bolsters me and all of our work to be in deep, uh, really deep relationships with probably by this time now hundreds of people around Minnesota. And it, allows us all to tap into each other's skills too. So I would put that high on everyone's list, getting really good at building lasting relationships. Mm, Jay, I love that. And it's like, well, why, why do people need to build relationships? We talk about relationships all the time, but I think this conversation can't happen anymore with in the vacuum without talking about COVID. I'm, I'm a nurse. My boyfriend's a nurse. We're hospital all the time. That's where our mind is. And when we think about like my, my client currently is a hospital trying to work on sustainability issues. Well, most people in sustainability roles within hospitals right now have been completely diverted from their sustainability or energy management role and are now doing crisis management for this pandemic. And I think we're going to be looking at months and, and years of fallout. And so why is it important to be in relationship? Because people are scared. And that goes even outside of, you know, the, the COVID situation. I think people are afraid of what could happen um, 
environment wise in the next decade plus. And so how do we support one another when the future is super uncertain? Um, and so I think also bringing in that awareness that why do we need to support one another? Because there's so much fear. Yeah. Um, okay, get to back, back to your, the question. Um, I'd say the skills that, that are helpful. Um, with 3M, 3M is a highly technical company. So really knowing the data and um, you know, knowing the facts. And a lot of times it's like getting really deep into the details, like a life cycle assessment or having some type of really, really deep technical understanding of the problem. Um, that's really important. Um, other things, yes, I agree, these soft skills are really important. Um, one is understanding someone else's perspective. Again, it's just knowing how to communicate with that person and to know what's relevant to them. Um, and the last thing that is really important is uh, influencing skills. Um, if you're trying to get into sustainability fields, you will be told no over and over and over and over again. Um, and so you need to learn how to be resilient um, and, you know, find, find a new approach or get some new data or find someone else to talk to um, and just keep honing those influencing skills. Sure. Yeah. Thank you all for, for sharing your perspectives on the question. Um, briefly, uh, we have Peter Levin on the line to explain kind of how audience questions are going to work. So I'll let him speak for just a little bit. Thanks, Jay, and thanks everyone for joining us and great panelists. Um, our democratic and safe way to submit questions is going to this website, slido.com, enter the event code EXPO20. You can also just take a screenshot in your camera of this QRC code. And there you can submit a question and they should pop up on this screen so everyone can see them. Um, let's see if there's any questions or it's not working. We're here to answer those. I believe too that questions can be upvoted on that system. So the more upvotes a question receives, it'll pop up to the top of the list. And so those questions can then be, oh, perfect. So that there is a question coming in. Okay. Um, I, I have one prepared question that I'm really passionate about that I, that I would like to ask everybody. And then we can move on to some of the audience questions that are coming in. But I'd like to ask, what issues do you feel are not given enough attention in your sector of sustainability and what do you think can be done to combat that? So this can be like a, a social perspective or something technical that kind of gets uh, brushed under the rug. Like for example, last year we had someone who spoke about water sustainability and how people kind of forget that water is a, such an important component of our lives and we kind of take for granted that we have clean water to drink. So that one example of something. Here's one that I think crosses all industries is culture. How do we shift culture? Um, I was at a panel at St. Kate's a few months ago um, where there were maybe some of you were at it, several artists coming together to talk about climate. And one of the things that was most profound to me was what this person said is that we're trying to fix a spiritual crisis with a technological solution. And I firmly believe that we have the, we have the technologies in place to solve these challenges, but do we have the human will and do we have, are we prepared to change those behaviors to actually make this happen? Um, so I know that that piece is kind of fluffy. The other thing I would say is um, we don't give enough attention to basically the mental health of the folks working in sustainability. Like Joanna said, we've been swimming upstream since we first got in the stream. So um, how do we prepare students coming into this and, and workers in this field that it's gonna be a really tough road um, with successes, of course, along the way. Fantastic point. Here's another perspective. Um, we do not yet know how to get the job done, which I think everyone in the world now agrees on. We need to get to net zero carbon by 2050 or before that. But we don't know how to get that job done now with renewable energy alone. We can get there 70 to 90% of our electricity can come from renewable energy, but we need more tools in the toolbox. And the ones that we are thinking about is 
carbon capture from gas and coal plants, taking the, those emissions down by 90 or 95%, which is now possible. We may need to keep carbon-free nuclear reactors open a few years longer as we spread out uh, more capacity for renewable energy and backup storage and batteries. Mm -hmm. And we also are definitely going to need to get into direct car air capture of carbon. We're not going to get there without that. And we need to really wrestle with that one. So these are, none of them are um, initially um, the first things that people think of when they think about sustainability, but no study shows that we can get there with 100% renewable energy now. So we are going to need everything and we're going to need the best people working on this and a lot of people talking about these. To, to put kind of, Jay, your thoughts and Shanda, your thoughts together, that it's not just resilience from a personal standpoint or a cultural standpoint, but to like a diversity of technologies that are going to get us to solutions that we need. That from multiple fronts, from the social side and the technical side, there's going to be all sorts of approaches that kind of need to come together in order for this to work. There were all sorts of problems that came together for, for our situation to happen, right? Right. Yeah. Sure. Uh, any thoughts, Joanna or Jose Luis? I lost the internet connection during your question, so I don't know what. Sure, I can repeat the question. It's okay. what issues do you feel are not given enough attention in your sector of sustainability and what can be done to combat that? Um, the, the biggest problem that I've been running into, um, I think, is a marketing solution. Um, so I think Sustainable, I haven't seen enough marketing people who are interested in sustainability or that they, that they don't see that those are relevant together. Um, but for companies like 3M, um, we, they need to know the landscape of the consumer or whoever their, um, their customer is um, to understand what sustainability challenges there they have and um, what solutions they're looking for. So, I mean, if, if 3M or another company like 3M knows that um, there's a, a challenge and a customer will buy a product if we make it, we will make that product. Like we have the technical capacity to make anything, but we some, sometimes, sometimes it, we will only make it if we know it'll be purchased. Um, so without having that marketing connection, um, that's been my challenge is um, prioritizing marketing resources to get the data that, to say that customers are really begging for this. Sure, and then uh, that also ties into then customers actually have a demand for something that is more sustainable. So from, from kind of the other side, that means that there maybe is like a cultural shift that needs to happen or a change in the way that as a society we think about sustainability that doesn't just include how do we buy and how do we sell and you know, from, from that sort of thing, but also how do, like when we consume, how are we consuming materials? And therefore that plays into every person's daily life and back to, uh, Shanda's point, like as those of us who take part in the healthcare system, whether we're participating in it or contributing to it, like there are still impacts that we have either way. So from all these different sides, it's becoming aware of what needs need to be met and also what desires are there. Sure. Uh, Mr. Villasenor, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, <clears throat> you know, I just uh, had a conversation with a group of students um, a couple months ago and something that came up around sustainability was just the, the stories I was hearing from them, from their grandparents or abuelitos or their moms in things that were seen as poverty, things that were seen as backwards, but yet um, we're, we're so sustainable um, and were images of being resilient uh, that now is a very commonplace. And that's, you know, having a, a bag, uh, a bag from home when you went grocery shopping or, making sure that, you know, that uh, being aware of being able to buy bulk products, um, um, you know, go, you know, uh, they talked a lot about um, going to open air markets to buy uh, produce, uh, all these things that for them felt that it was something that was, was bad. Um, 
because uh, it wasn't commonplace that was that white folks were doing in their communities. And so I think in sustainability, I think we have to acknowledge that there's been a history of, of being sustainable, of being aware, like you mentioned, that water is, is life. It is important and sacred uh, to a lot of nations and, and folks. And so I think those conversations, I think we're missing within the sustainability conversation. And I agree, there, there, there are different levels of technologies and efforts, but I think it's important to, uh, like I always like to say, keep it simple as much as we can, uh, but also make sure, you know, when we're talking about environmental justice or sustainability, it gives us an opportunity to say who's missing. Um, and I think that's uh, an opportunity. And I think another thing we run into um, is making sure that we don't continue to promote the, the urban and rural divide and the fact that there are folks outside the metro area that are facing the same uh, issues that we're fa facing in their cities and have the same questions. It's just at times uh, we're pitted against each other and seeing that, that we're not working uh, for, for the same sustainable future that we're all looking for. So. Yeah, and one, one point that I'd like to add that, that your story reminds me of is in light of the, the coronavirus pandemic, that the issue of getting testing kits out to places where actually getting those test results back because they don't have the technology to, to do that because it requires advanced laboratory instrumentation. There was one uh, professor from Stanford, I, I can't remember his name at the moment, but he worked with a team of researchers to develop like a $1 centrifuge and a $1 microscope to help um, diagnose malaria in third world countries so that it's actually something that could be manufactured cheaply and was accessible to everybody. So that those kinds of technologies to help with public health issues in those areas where it's not just, oh, you need to have a laboratory where you can do, you know, these very advanced biotechnology techniques in order to get people basic information about their health. And it kind of down the same, um, uh, Mr. Francis Bedellune, he works at the UMN Native American Medicine Gardens and he's a master gardener there. and. I had the opportunity to speak with him a few times in my freshman year and learn that so much of the sustainability principles of keeping things simple and kind of going back to our roots started with indigenous ways of thinking and have existed for thousands of years and that we sort of lost because time trampled over all of those really rich, deep cultural ideas. And so I think hearkening back through history and the, to the point that you make is super powerful in informing how we can move forward, not just using science and technology that we are just learning now today, but going back to principles that have been known for forever. So I think that that's a, that's a really power powerful perspective that I think I, a lot of people will appreciate. Um, I'm gonna shift to a Slido question here. It's our top voted question. It says, what lessons do you think we are learning as a society through the COVID-19 crisis that we can use in other sustainability challenges? The first lesson I've learned is be flexible. Um, my own life, like all of yours, has been put on a new path and it's not clear what that path is. And it's likely, according to who you're reading, that anywhere from we'll be dealing with this pandemic as a top most item maybe for six months, maybe for 18 months. And it's going to be really difficult to correct our own country's economy and all of the equity problems in our society. And we're also going to need to solve this climate crisis too. So we really have our work cut out for us. Thank goodness we are so well connected that we're able to do this Zoom conference, for example. But we're gonna need a lot more like that too. And flexibility is going to be in really short supply. And we're gonna to need to learn to flex more. Okay, so it looks like uh, Joanna's connection is cut out temporarily, so. Hopefully you can rejoin us in a bit. But in the meantime, uh, Shanda or Jose Luis, do you have any other thoughts about this question? You know, I, I've been having conversations in communities, um, Latino community, indigenous communities around just food uh, access and, and, you know, 
having national conversations about how we're going to get food to folks um, in, a, in a safe manner. Uh, but I, I think it's it's allowed us to create to identify broken systems um, and to find innovative grassroots people-based um, solutions. And I, whether that's me having conversations with our commissioner or with community members, I feel there's been a, a let go of, uh, of, of some um, structure that keeps us from dreaming something different that centers people. Um, and so that's been something that I've kind of witnessed and just my conversations I've had either with my neighbors or uh, on other on other meetings I've had I've had or and or um, at the state I feel like there's a a, a larger need to think uh, outside uh, structures that we have been using in the past and so I don't know uh, that's something that's been really um, personally useful and great to be a part of. Mm. Yeah, thank you for both of those answers so far. Um, I have a thought and then I've been waiting for like the opportune moment to read this little snippet and, and I didn't know if it would be like in an earlier meeting today, but anyway, I'll, I'll get there. Um, so I, as far as what we've learned from the COVID-19 um, situation, we've learned a lot about response. I don't know that we've learned a lot about solution definitively yet. Um, as far as response, what makes this what makes this pandemic different from other like large global scale issues like climate change, right? Um, so suddenly we're seeing nations across the planet turn on, respond both from a leadership perspective and individually. And I think I think media has an enormous amount to do with that. I think people suddenly seeing this in their own communities have has something to do with that. Um, and so I, we're learning as we go, but it, it's been really compelling to, to watch just news outlets and social media blow up basically. Um, so, you know, as far as huge crises, COVID, yes, climate, yes. And this little snippet that I want to read is from um, a nonfiction work that just came out from um, an author named John Wallum from 1964 Anchorage earthquake. Um, and it's called This is Chance. And this is just a paragraph. Um, but this earthquake was at the time the largest in the world. Now it's the second largest in the world. And it was um, basically right after Alaska had just been made a state. And so um, Ohio University sent these, these um, sociologists out there to do disaster research. And, and this is kind of their thought as they were researching in, in the aftermath. Um, so years later, Dr. Corntelli would co-author an article speculating about why the Disaster Research Center was documenting so little conflict in its studies of disaster-stricken communities around the world. In the paper, he compared a town coping with disaster to an audience watching a play. Like good theater, Corntelli wrote, disasters do not involve mundane matters but often the very issue of human life itself. These themes, usually dormant in daily life, suddenly spill out in public for all to see. An unrelenting immediacy sets in. Worries about the past and future are unrealistic when judged against the realities of the moment. And distinctions between people fall away, leaving only human beings responding to one another as human beings. As a consequence, all those who share in the experience are brought together in a very powerful psychological sense by their common participation in such a dramatic event. To victims, the disaster is our disaster. So what does it take for sustainability to become everyone's disaster or climate to become everyone's disaster? Yeah, thank you for sharing that. That's a that's a really powerful excerpt. And definitely a message that going forward is going to become more important now that we see like how we have to respond all together to something that just happened so quickly that this issue has been developing for a very long time. And now we're working to try and resolve the issue in a very, very short space. So definitely relevant. Other thoughts? 
No, I, I, I grew up in Alaska. And so that, 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 that statement and uh, the idea of just the resiliency and the need to come together was something we learned a lot about in school, especially in elementary, in learning about the earthquake that continue to happen, uh, not at that level. But yeah, that, so that means a lot, the, that, that bringing that up. It, it brings up a lot of thought wow. about um, whether it was an earthquake or the fact it was a volcano that, that would erupt you know, in the ocean, we would have to prepare and spend time inside, mm -hmm. but yet uh, mm -hmm. there was a very, a, a communal kind of response that we're in this together and we're gonna figure this out and keep each other yeah. safe. So thanks for reading that. This reminds me of a maxim that I use when I'm talking about climate change, but it also covers the topic of COVID. Think about it this way. The more urgently we act and the smarter the public policy we get enacted, the fewer people will suffer. And the most important part of that sentence is, to me, the fewer people will suffer. That's why I'm, in, that's why I'm in all sorts of sustainability work, to protect more people. So Joanna, I think your internet cut out for a little bit there. So I'm gonna repeat uh, a summary of the question. I don't have the original question up, but it was to the effect of what lessons can we learn from responding to the COVID-19 pandemic in our efforts to advance sustainability um, solutions. I'm not sure if, if our connection is stable or not, but I guess we can w wait a minute here if anyone else has anything, any other thoughts to respond before she's able to come back on the line. Okay, it looks like her connection is dropped. So for now, I think we'll move on, but we'll, we'll get back and see if she has any thoughts on that question later. Um, another vote, top voted question here is, what, recommend, what recommendations do you have for people trying to get into the sustainability field? Find your thing. What's, what's your thing? Um, sustainability is so vast. So um, if you're, I, I talked a little bit before about, um, you know, folks who are going through programs that are, you know, more officially sustainability or more strictly hard science, but we all need to be addressing this. And so if you're an artist or a writer or a dancer or a construction worker, like sustainability can, it does overlap that. And so if you have a particular passion, think about how that can go hand in hand with, with environmental and climate work. Yeah, I okay, now that we have uh, Joanna back on the line, uh, if you have any thoughts about the previous question, it's what lessons can we learn from the response to the COVID-19 pandemic in advancing sustainability solutions? Right. Yeah. And I apologize. Um, I live in an older home with, um, yeah, and uh, I get bumped out when the heat goes on and goes off. I don't, I don't know what the deal is. But anyway, um, yeah, so <laughs> COVID-19, um, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of disappointed that I feel like we haven't learned much yet. And something you know somebody else. But I, Joanna, I think your video is skipping a little bit. So I think that hopefully people are learning. Hmm. Just a, a quick note. Continue. Your video seems to be cutting. Sorry, if it would be possible to go on mute. your video, then we can just hear you. I think that may work better. Let's see if that can. Let's see if that can work. Is that is that is that working better? Yes, I think so. Okay. okay, so I think the lesson we've learned is we're not as strong and resilient, we being the things we are. The um, lesson that I hope we'll learn is most importantly that we don't need as much stuff as we think we do. You still can't hear me? And we can hear you. Yep. Okay. Um, we don't need as much stuff as we think we do.
So, so you said briefly, like that that you feel that the United States isn't responding necessarily as well as we should. So, what, what things can therefore can we learn from that? And you mentioned like we don't need as much stuff as we think we need. So, going forward, right? Like in terms of sustainability, what are things that we can learn from that? Going. Uh oh. Okay. So it looks like it looks like your connection is dropped again. So we will try to come back come back around. But I guess for, for now, we'll move on to the question that I had mentioned a little bit earlier, which is recommendation. what recommendations do you have for people trying to get into the sustainability field? Uh, thank you, Shanda, for your thoughts. Does anyone else have thoughts on that question? I guess, you know, I would echo um, what folks have said so far in that, you know, what is your niche? What's your passion? Um, and what, what drives you into the work of sustainability? Um, and I think, um, I feel like when I talk to young folks, I always remind them that <clears throat> uh, everything you're learning, everything you've gained and knowledge doesn't belong to you um, and to find ways to give that back. So as, as, a, as a model of paying it forward, right? Sure. Uh, Jay, do you have any thoughts on the question? I love what I've heard so far. I just love, what I love about sustainability is that it's inherently multidisciplinary. And you get to choose a couple of disciplines that you really, you really feel are vital. And I, I encourage you to get the technical skills in those fields and draw the connections between those fields because that's what I have found makes audiences all over this state fascinated when they hear that it's not just about um, what I studied, not just geography and aquatic chemistry and climatology, but now I work on a daily basis with economists and professional storytellers and people who are specializing in all kinds of different disciplines that we never thought of pulling together. And you need to find what resonates best for you, for your skills, your inherent talents, and then work very hard to brush up those talents and try to get yourself to become a big thinker in that area. And that will take some time. But the way I see these, all of these sustainability problems, there are very few that are solved very quickly. Um, most of these are things that we're gonna be working on in our professional lives. I know I've worked on some problems for 20 years. Sometimes you get lucky and something comes up and the problem is resolved in about two years but they're all long-term. And so you want to really find those subfields that you're most energized by. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. For now, for now anyway. Um, for now, yes, yeah. we can. <laughs> um, I guess I, I'd say, I kind of echo what everyone else is saying, um, but I think it's interesting that you can, you don't necessarily need to go into a, job that has sustainability in the title. Right? No matter what you, what role you're looking for, or like you're saying, whatever you're interested in, you can find a sustainability angle. So from an engineering perspective, um, you can look at what raw materials you're sourcing or making sure that the product has recycled um, components or just that the packaging is recyclable. I mean, there's a lot of really easy things we can still be doing with sustainability in mind. Yeah, I think that's a really important point too, that it doesn't necessarily mean like that wherever you work has to have sustainability in the title, that it has to be a central tenant, but that it can still become part of the, whatever company you're working for in any sort of discipline. So yeah, thank you for all of your thoughts on that. That's so, something that as a student is really refreshing to hear and it's not like we have to find one specific thing and it can be a whole slew or variety and it can come in all, all different forms. Uh, another question that's been upvoted here is, how do you balance sustainability and politics in your day-to-day -day lives? Uh, 
things as decision making, communication, policy, funding, or whatever is most relevant to you. Well, I think I want to make a segue between what you just brought up, VJ, and this question. Sure. Because um, in my career, um, I don't, you'll notice I don't have sustainable sustainability in my title. And it's never been um, in our mission at Fresh Energy. And there's a reason for that. Because when we got started almost 30 years ago, it was a, a little bit of a suspect, um, a suspect academic um, protocol, I think. And it's gotten much better than that. But still, it's a word that distance, distances, distances certain people from us. And so sometimes I don't even like to use the word. But I use lots of other synonymous things. Like I, I, and I encourage everyone to talk about stressing the lower costs of this sustainable solution that you're talking about. Stress the money saved that is moving more businesses to adopt this sustainable frame without using the term sustainable even. And emphasize your solutions as cool, often local technology, um, driven by innovators and entrepreneurs. Um, people still tend to idolize individual action in our culture um, and it's not the be all and end all. Um, but you have to branch out with your communications because you're not talking to everyone who necessarily has the same background and politics that you do. But we need all of these people to be working on sustainability. So be creative about how you message about it. Yeah, I think in general, in, in the scientific community, being able to communicate the importance and relevance of the work that's being done is super important in a way that's not opaque to everyone outside the community. So that's a that's an important point that using the word sustainability can alienate certain people or push them away from things that actually are good for all of us. That's, that's a really excellent point that can often be overlooked. Awesome. Um, yeah, so um, I guess I, politics doesn't really play a big role um, being in a corporate place like 3M. Um, so I don't really have to balance that. One thing I just wanted to bring up was um, sustainability isn't just environmental sustainability. So I actually do hear a lot about sustainability at work, um, but they're typically talking about economic sustainability. You know, is a product sustainable over the long term? You know, is it, is it worthwhile to make this product? Is it going to be economically viable in five years? Um, so, so I don't really get the stigma around sustainability at work. Um, so I think that's another thing just to remember that sustainability isn't just the environment, it's economic and it's social as well. So mm -hmm. Just a little sidebar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's also an excellent point that all these different pieces of what we call sustainability have to play into each other and work together. Okay. Thoughts from either from Shando or Jose Luis? I get a little bit of a cop out. Um, for the last almost 20 years, the Gallup poll has shown that nurses are the most trusted profession in the United States and other health professionals come shortly after that. Uh, we've learned that Congress members fall at the bottom. Uh, not, not dead last, I, I don't quote me on that at all. Um, but I, I think from what we've heard from some of the other panelists so far is, yeah, it's a really contentious subject when you start talking about sustainability in, in the political realm, even though we, we know it's science, right? Um, so, Coming back to the, the trusted piece, um, I lean heavily on being a nurse. I lean heavily on sharing stories, you know, my own stories or stories of um, patients that I've worked with that are having experiences in their real lives related to the environment, related to climate. So I think one thing that 
we could all do better is make it local and make it relevant. Um, and when we're having these conversations, you don't have to be a nurse, right? Like, like make it human and try to draw the line between um, sustainability and what somebody else's experience is, or better yet, have them share their experience and you draw the, you know, make those connections with how that relates to a healthy environment, a sustainable environment, and how politics doesn't really have anything to do with that um, from a stark perspective, right? So, so I, think, I think we could definitely do our due diligence in helping people to understand that this is very relevant for them personally, and sometimes even more importantly, for their children or for their grandchildren. Um, because that's, a, that's often a ubiquitous thing that people care about is the future generations. Mm -hmm. I'd like to talk for just a minute or two about how we do our work at Fresh Energy. Because we work primarily on energy policy, as well as climate policy, but mostly energy. And when we started doing this work many years ago, the energy supply system in Minnesota and the country and the globe had not really changed since the 1950s or the 1970s. And that has utterly changed in the last 15 years. Thank goodness for all of us. And that's why we are starting to see the inklings of solving this climate problem. But before we got to that point, we started seeking out, spending time with CEOs often of utilities or at the very upper echelons of their staff. And this strategy took a couple of years because remember what I said earlier about building relationships and establishing trust. It takes a couple of years. But what we found was we were seeking out people who had core values similar to ours. Now notice, I'm not saying identical to ours. We were looking for something like 50% commonality in core values. And much to our surprise, the people we have reached out to over the last 10 or 12 years, we have often found 85 to 90% of our core values are almost identical. And so when we learn that, we typically find we don't need to find people who are just like us. And I still collaborate with lots of people around Minnesota who are always looking or seeking everyone to pool around the same identical values. I don't think we have time for that. And when you agree with core values on 85% of what you're interested in doing for your communities and your families, you can move forward immediately on projects. And that is what we've done. So I encourage you, some of you at least, to think about taking that approach and finding a way to fit it into what you do. Yeah, thank you for that perspective. And especially now in these very divisive times. Now, of course, with, with the global pandemic, we're all finding ways to connect with each other and to work together in order to do things for, like, that are health, healthy and helpful for everybody. But definitely in the, in the past couple of years, we've seen people kind of separating and dividing based on very localized beliefs and having this group think kind of mindset and kind of being in an echo chamber and being able to find commonalities in order to work together is a really valuable, not just a skill, but just like something that all of us can, can learn from and thrive with. So I, I personally really appreciate that. And I, I hope that the audience really finds value in, in, in your remarks as well. Um, Jose Luis, do you have any remarks uh, on this question? And it doesn't even, we can just continue the conversation. It doesn't necessarily have to be on this question. In particular. No, I mean, I agree with what everyone else is saying too as well. And I kind of, I kind of like this idea and I think it's really important to kind of, you know, for me in the words, environmental justice and sustainability, even policy, 
stuff like that. They're all, for me, code words that at times alienate folks that don't talk about sustainability or environmental justice in that way or environmental racism. But I think, you know, how I come to this work every day, especially around environmental justice and sustainability is that, you know, and the, as the agency and in, and in my day to day life is how do we, you know, one quote I like to follow is how do we seek to repair harm, but not erase history. And I say that in the aspects that when talking to permanent engineers to talking to engineers at our agency is that, you know, when we talk about overburning communities or air quality concerns, there's a system that has been out at play to make neighborhoods so toxified. And so we have to talk about that race matters. We gotta talk a lot about, when talking about sustainability, talking about redlining, uh, what's really hip now that people are talking about, especially at the U, is you know racial covenants uh, and all those systems that have kind of you know disfranchised communities. Um, and that's a place where I start uh, any conversation, whether in the community or in our agency, is to just kind of identify the systems that have kept people away from the conversations and also just be aware of the wordings that we use that may alienate communities that say sustainability or say environmental justice and, and, and other ways uh, yeah. that's culturally based um, in their experience, experiences. Mm -hmm. And so that's definitely what kind of how I address policy or conversation about sustainability, whether on my block in East Phillips or in St. Paul at the agency. Sure, yeah, thank you for that. And definitely like all, all of these different pieces of like people not necessarily understanding how these pieces of sustainability fit together because we use language that's not familiar. I think is a, is a theme that's coming up that it's like these are all we're all talking about some of the same things but because they're coming from all different places and we all have our own ways of discussion discussing these issues that being able to properly communicate what work we're doing and how it's helpful as opposed to kind of hiding behind the nomenclature of our field behind you know the vocabulary that we use is a really important point um i can i add something i'm sorry and sure go I ahead think the other piece too is that when we're talking about sustainability, I think it has to be it has to be centered in wealth building and also anti displacement strategies. Sure. Yeah. Could you clarify a little bit more for, for people who don't necessarily are not familiar with, with what that might mean? Uh, you know, I think there's there's always an opportunity when talking about sustainability that is based on you know, um, you know, being able to have access to resources or an electric vehicle, things of that nature. But we, we need to talk about, and you know, sometimes it doesn't come up as often as I like it to. We need to talk about historical unemployment within communities of color. We need to talk about uh, how does sustainability not just be that you have a job sorting trash uh, or recyclables, uh, you know, so that we're challenging the notion of sustainability while, um, you know, talking about how do we create um, jobs in our communities um, and how do we create sustainability that doesn't promote gentrification or promote that now this neighborhood sustainable and affordable for those are not affordable for those that historically have lived in these communities. Um, and I think any strategy or any campaign or any conversation I'm a part of, those three things are really important. How does this build wealth within communities that have been historically uh, um, historically affected by unemployment and how does this promote that folks can continue to live in their communities? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for, for, for the clarification and for bringing that to light. Um, I don't know if we have any more audience questions, but I have one last thing that I think we can use before we wrap up here. Um, sort of a continuation of, of the previous question was asked by an audience member about the coronavirus outbreak. Um, this is a question I prepared, said, what do you feel work, students working on sustainability, environmental justice, climate policy, et cetera, can take away in terms of mobilizing action for these issues in general? And how about specifically at this time with social distancing, distancing in place? Any thoughts? I know this is a this is a very multi-layered question. 
Well, I don't have a comment on social distancing, but um, I think what people need when dealing with COVID or dealing with climate change or any of the other big sustainability problems, they need to have hope. And I saw the question that's on the screen now, what gives you hope? And here is what gives me hope. And I encourage people who go out and talk to people about sustainability in general, or who talk about climate solutions, please give people more reason to hope. And I wanna give you a couple of specific examples. You remember I said, when we first started working with transforming the utility system in Minnesota to a clean energy economy, we're now well on that way, it was really hard for the first 10 years because it was still stuck in the 1950s or the 1970s. And it was only in the last couple of years that we found out that one of the biggest utility companies in Minnesota, Excel Energy, that owns the nuclear plants, we found out that they had internally given the challenge to the managers of its two nuclear plants to see if they could operate that plant and ramp it up and down. What does that mean? That means I grew up learning about nuclear energy and learning that it was only available to us and economic for us running 24 seven. And we have found now that that is no longer true. And that is good news for everyone on this call and everyone in this state. Because if you can ramp down the nuclear plants and they're able to ramp them down to be still making money, ramping them down, in one case, 39% of the time. If you run a nuclear plant 39% less, that means every single year you are producing 39% less nuclear waste. And that's a solution for everyone. And then similarly, we also found that the same utility company was internally seeing when running the coal plants made sense to take them offline. And I really want to drive this home for people. Excel Energy is going to go to zero coal, 0% 0 coal, running no coal plants, the latest in 2030. That's a victory for everyone in this state. And you should make sure everyone knows about that. But it's better than that because they also ask the managers of the coal plants when it doesn't make economic sense to run them coal plants. And they have found for two of their largest coal plants, and they've started in March this year, they're going to schedule those coal plants so that they don't produce any coal-fired power in the spring and the fall. They don't need them. That's an advantage for everyone. And what that means, remember the coal plants are gonna go offline by 2028, one case, and another by 2030. It means they still have another nine or 10 years for those coal plants. And some of them are gonna be running 50% of the time and not 100% of the time. And we calculated and we've been confirmed, we've re received affirmation from Excel Energy that we're right. It means 5 million tons of CO2 because of that decision on the coal plants will not go into Minnesota's air before 2030. Isn't that a good story? You need to tell that story to more people and they should start asking the other utility company that is right now on the hook and probably after 2030 will run the only coal plant left in Minnesota. It's the Boswell plant in Cohasset, Minnesota, next door to Grand Rapids. And we need to get them 
to see the light and close down the coal plant as early as possible. Hope, hope, and this, these are facts that present the hope to more people. Thank you. That's, that's a fantastic story and not something that I was aware of either. I'm not from the state, but that's fantastic progress to hear. So let's, let's keep going. We have a few more minutes left, but if anyone else wants to share their thoughts, what gives you hope? I'd like to offer um, impartial response to your other question as well. You know, what can people take away from this COVID experience? Uh, we're seeing cleaner air, we're seeing cleaner water, we're seeing massive public mobilization, um, and we're seeing that it's possible. So when we think about what we're going to need to do in the sustainability field, climate-wise and planetary health-wise in the very new future, um, we're seeing that civilization for the most part can still carry on without having our cars on the roads and without having our bodies in the workplace. Now granted, we've seen a lot of fallout that's not good for families and individuals related to job loss and that sort of thing, but we can continue to figure out how we're going to support these people during this process. Um, but looking to the future, we I think what's most hopeful to me is that people aren't just staying idle, people aren't giving up in this COVID fight, and so we know that that is possible to apply to other large-scale solutions as well. Yeah, so just um, one comment. So I've been working from home for the last several weeks already, um, and I live on a street in Stillwater that is um, a common street for people to walk along. Um, and since we've been home more, there is two to three more times as many people just taking walks. You know, they're, they're spending more time outside. Um, and I think that's really, really great to see. You know, people are maybe there, they're getting a little tired of being so connected virtually that they're looking for an outlet and um, getting out in the natural environment is really important. You know, how else are you going to understand that it's something worth protecting if you're not spending time in it? Um, so I've been really, really pleased to see so many different people just outside. Any other closing thoughts? No, I was just going to say that, you know, what gives me a lot of hope is, you know, I'm a father of three little boys and um, the fact that uh, they can identify food growing in a garden or food as we're walking along the Mississippi, even medicine. Um, and um, I think it just gives me a lot of hope. Uh, and I also agree. I think um, the hope that I was, also the hope I'm he seeing and being a part of, uh, that I was mentioning earlier, uh, that we're, we're challenging ourselves uh, even right now of what education is, how we will roll education out, and that's really big for me right now as I've become a, a, a teacher at home of three little boys, um, mm -hmm. that um, I'm hearing from principals and teachers that uh, the experiences they're having in these nature walks that we're doing um, it is also important and a part of their education. And I just feel like this is giving me hope in that we're thinking outside the box and we're acknowledging or continue to acknowledge the fact that we need to have more marginalized groups voices involved in this process and how they're being affected. Uh, and I feel like I've been a part of this conversation just recently. And uh, I think it's just been really hopeful for me. Um, and um, um, so, yeah, that's what I would say. Hey, this is Beth Mercer Taylor, um, and I know we're moving towards wrapping, but um, I would just invite our presenters to share how students and other community members, faculty, staff, if they're excited about what they're hearing from you and they want to support your work, um, we can share, you know, your links and so on, but could you just uh, give them a couple words about what might be possible for them um, with your organizations and efforts? Yeah, definitely. I can jump in really quick. You know, at the agency, we're always looking for folks that um, would like to come talk about how they're talking about sustainability or environmental justice work. Uh, we're always looking for those partnerships and also the, the aspect of health or uh, um, 
health equity um, is also a big piece too. So, um, you know, feel free to reach out. Um, but those are the conversations we want to bring into the agency. Uh, on the other side, my community work away from the agency, uh, we have a, um, an urban farm where we're always looking for volunteers to come grow food with us. We're still teething out what that would look like with social distancing, but it's definitely something we're ramping up to do and also having it to be a site where we'll be distributing supplies for communities in South Minneapolis. So you can follow us on, um, on Facebook or things of that nature for opportunities to help out with social distancing and or from online. And I'm Jay, I'm with Fresh Energy. So our website is fresh-energy.org and has a wealth of stories of how we've started to move Minnesota very fast to a clean energy economy. And take a look at it. We use lots of volunteers and we love people and we want more people to be counting things. We want them to be helping track for the larger um, society. How many coal plants have we closed so far? When are the next ones going to retire? How few years will that take? And at the same time, we need to build thousands of megawatts of more wind power and more solar power. And the good news, the source of hope, is wind and solar is now the cheapest form of new electricity. And yeah, we'll so please, um, check out Health Students for a Healthy Climate. It's uh, an official student group at the University of Minnesota that's fully interdisciplinary. All um, health and pre-health professional students and others getting together to talk all about how climate impacts human health and what to do about it. So this is Joanna. Um, obviously, if you're looking for for jobs or the work you can do with 3M, go to online. Um, students should look at the tech aid positions. Those are super great roles for um, technical employees. Um, and then also there's a, a, a lot of internships that they offer as well. So look for those. Um, but I really encourage you, as other people are saying, is get involved in your community. And that's really why I looked out to that group, um, Sustainable Stillwater Minnesota. Um, you know, think global, act local. It's so much easier to have a big impact in a smaller community um, and then hopefully all of these small communities learn from each other and there's a trickle effect so do what you can um, close to home all right thank you everyone thank you to all the panelists for joining us and for all the audience members uh joining us virtually um awards are going to take place in this room starting shortly so just stay on the line if you if you'd like to watch thank you all again and hope you all have a wonderful weekend stay safe Thank you. Likewise. Thank you so Thank much. You. Bye.